do that to you, but you can't do that to the kids. This is what they say. Don't try to keep up with the technology. You can't. You'll only look stupid. And I don't know that you've got a lot of teachers that want to look stupid. I certainly don't. So the teachers need to, if they're going to go to classes, they need to go to classes where they understand what these technologies can do so they can help the students evaluate quality, figure out where the tools will help. I'll give you some examples here. One of, I had a wonderful experience in Canada not too long ago, last summer, where somebody almost did what I wanted, which is bring 50, like one kid per person. We had a one-third kids and one -third te two-thirds teachers. We took the teachers, the kids, we said, okay, you got six hours of lab time, which is essentially a, a weekend's homework assignment, to divide yourself into groups and use technology in some way that shows the teachers how you would like to be taught. And I didn't give them much guidance. They self-divided into 10 teams. We had videos, we had podcasts, we had, we had all sorts of different, we had MySpace, we had, I can't even think of all the technology. There were 10 different technologies, SMS, games, Flash. They made these examples in six hours and wowed the teachers. It was really amazing. How many of you have encountered issues around the Wikipedia and whether kids should use it or not? Don't all raise your hands at once. So terribly interactive. A lot of people do. A lot of people say, ah, should I let my kids use it? It may not be right, it may not be true, etc. That's not what you should do with the Wikipedia. With the Wikipedia, you assign kids to create an entry in the Wikipedia. And then you discuss what the different groups create and you talk about what a good entry should be in an encyclopedia. And you evaluate that. And you teach about search versus research, which is another article I have online. Search, anything goes, you're searching. Wikipedia, fine, it's a great starting place. Research, totally different. There are rules for research that have a long tradition. The re in research means more than one source. Kids need to know this. Fair use versus plagiarism, we talked about how that's changing. Instant messaging. We hear all these complaints, it's ruining spelling. Well, no, it's not. Turns out that it's an informal language and it's got its own informal spelling. Kids have to know that that's real different than a formal language and when to use each because it's just as wrong to use informal language and formal spelling as it is to use formal language and informal spelling. So we could design classes using only instant messaging and evaluate those and think about that. Phone-based cameras. How many of you ban them? You know? I can't think of a better tool for learning than every kid having their own camera or video. You can collect data, you can make things, you can illustrate ideas, a picture's worth a thousand words, blah, blah, blah. You can Photoshop them, you can have contests, you can talk about the creativity and how good they are and what they represent, and you can deal with pictures versus words. You can deal with appropriate versus inappropriate. You can deal with truth versus manipulation. As a teacher, you have to teach the big ideas, not the technology. Everybody awake? Engagement. It's only once we're engaged with the kids, that we're talking with them, that we're involved with them, that we can begin to engage them. It's not about like creating all this stuff. Okay, great, that's engaging. If you don't engage with the kids, you're never gonna get there. But once you do that, I'm gonna equate engagement with motivation and passion. Because without that, no learning takes place. If you're not motivated to learn something other than you know, what you see in the world, you won't learn it. But more important is the opposite. That once a student, a boy or a girl or a young man or a young woman is motivated, then there's no stopping them then they will learn wherever they can. That's what's happening in China. That's what's happening all over the world now. Learning comes from passion, not discipline. Now, we all know that our job is to engage our kids. I'm not here to tell you as educators that your job is to engage your kids. You know that, or you better know that. The issue is that engagement is changing. So in the olden days, as that girl said, you could engage the kids with a good lecture or a stick, right? But you can't 
do that anymore. You can't push it on the kids, they have to want it. You can't tell the kids, you have to ask them. You can't hand them content, they have to help invent it. We have to involve our students in everything we do. Sure, it takes effort. You know, those complain, oh, it can't all be fun and games. Learning takes work. Well, it takes effort. But the point is that that effort can feel like work in some instances, and in other instances, it feels like play. And we've all had those experiences in our, in our sports, in our hobbies, when we're lucky in our work, of putting out lots of effort and it feeling like play. And that's what happens when you're engaged, when you have that engagement and passion. And the young people today understand this. Because when I grew up, it was kind of boring intellectually. Once you had enough reading, you were nothing else to do. But today's students go online and they tell us, I could have nothing to do, I could always find something on the internet. This whole online emerging digital life. So they know what engagement feels like. They'd like to feel it all the time. It's obviously a good feeling to be engaged. They'd like to feel it when they're learning because they know how to do that. But obviously, with the obvious exception of New Zealand, I have to say, you guys have it down, much of our education is so unengaging that it feels like we're sitting there with little bottles of depressants in the air. And the kids know this. <laughs> you know, which road should I go on today? Hey, Southern California, you know. They tell us, when I go to school, I have to power down. That's pretty scary, because they're not talking about their devices, they're talking about their brains. And I was in Liverpool not too long ago, and they said, is that really true? The teachers asked the kids. The kid thought for a second, he said, you know, you do have to slow down when you're talking to your teachers. <laughs> so the point is that for today's students to learn, engagement, not content, has to be our number one goal. Now, I'm not saying that the content's unimportant or kids don't have to pass the test or anything like that. I'm saying they will do that when they are engaged. And if you're gonna make a lesson plan, at the very top, it's not what am I gonna to teach today, it's how am I gonna engage my kids today. We have to involve them because the only ones who are gonna tell us that are the kids. Outside of school, they are totally engaged and empowered. They put their own mark on the internet. They don't wanna just find stuff. Tim Berners-Lee told us when he created the World Wide Web, it's a publishing medium. What you put into it is what counts. That's why MySpace is so important. That's why blogs are so important. They're hands-on. In the games world, where I come from, they're making half the content. If you play The Sims, the furniture, all that stuff is made by the players. If you play World of Warcraft, the helmets, the stuff that you need, the swords, the players make a lot of that stuff. They have the tools to do it, because this is a real important point, the difference between the old technology, the analog technology of, that we grew up with, and digital technology, is that digital technology is programmable. You can make it do what you want it to do. And the kids are all programmers, because every time you download a ringtone, you're programming. Every time you do a search, you're programming. And they're learning much more sophisticated ways, especially game programming. And the reason this is so important, folks, is that programming, if you believe Prensky, is gonna be the key tool and literacy of the 21st century. It's not gonna be write me a paper about how to do it, it's gonna be show me a program that does it. We couldn't collect money over the internet in the States for political campaigns, somebody wrote a program. Guy couldn't sell his wife's Pez collection on, on, through auctions online, he wrote a program. That's turned into eBay. Those guys are billionaires. That's what's gonna happen in the future. Now here's an opportunity for engagement that I don't think we're taking advantage of. I bet you almost every one of your students, or certainly within the next few years, will have a powerful computer in their pocket. It's called their mobile phone or their cell phone, right? What do we do? We ban them. What should we do? We should be using them. Because with a little imagination, these powerful, inexpensive computers that the kids already bring with them, they're already one-to-one, -one, that are useful for communication, that can have all sorts of add-ons like cameras and GPS, we could figure out ways to use this instead of thinking of them as cheating machines. 
we could use them as they are already doing in some countries like China for learning skills and languages and poetry and public speaking and surveys and polls. And instead of cheating, we could think about how to use them for assessment by evaluating voice prints and other things. Here's a question for you. Now I really want you to be interactive. Suppose in the middle of the day, you got a call from your own son or daughter who was in school. And they asked you kind of a strange question. They said, Mom or Dad, what's the capital of Sri Lanka? Anybody know? Colombo, right? Okay. I played Carmen San Diego as a kid. That's how I learned it. And so we all know this. It's Colombo. But you suspected that your son or daughter was in the middle of a test. How many of you would not tell them the answer, even if you knew it? Okay, you feel free, you can tell me. No penalties here, it's not gonna go on your permanent record. How many would tell them? I'm with those who would tell them. Why? Not because I'm for cheating, we have to redefine what cheating means, but because it's about time we started evaluating kids with their tools. As one person said, you can go on TV, you can win a million dollars with a lifeline. How come I can't use a lifeline to get the answer to one silly question on a test? We have to start saying, can you do this? So I'm a big advocate of evaluating kids with their tools, redefining what cheating means, sharing the tools when kids don't have them all, and giving kids, for example, open phone tests. And have you tried that? What a good, in fact, why don't we just all take out our cell phones and turn them on right now, you know? Here's the kicker. The people who have tried this, and there are people doing this, they say when you do this, you can ask harder questions. Because they're no longer limited to what they know in their head or facts or something. You can have them ask very complex questions where they have to go out and get information. Now here's the kicker. One girl came up to me at, when I had given this same talk, and she said at the end, you know, Mr. Prince, I have to tell you something. You know, it's really that most of our phone, most of our tests actually are open phone tests. You guys just don't know it yet. <laughs> right? I can look you in the eye, she said, and be texting the answer in my pocket, and looking down at you'll never know. So how could we integrate this? This is a question I'm going to leave you with. And I thought this was like for the far future, but I'm in South Carolina in the US, rural South Carolina, giving a talk, and I said exactly what I said to you. A week later, I get an email from the superintendent who says, I got this from a teacher, she went back to her elementary school class and she said to them, how could we use cell phones in this class? And what did they come up with? Interviewing experts using standard English, business etiquette, researching, text messaging, reviewing for quizzes, taking pictures of things on the blackboard. This is one class one day. Imagine if you put all your heads together and all your kids to figure out ways. Now, obviously there are issues. You don't want it to be disturbing, you don't want it to have this, but we can figure out ways around the issues, especially if we talk to the kids. Because this is the big issue, it's respect. And I'll maintain, some of the people have talked about respect, that although few of us would admit it, most of us disrespect our students. I'm talking about the people in this room, especially vis-a-vis -vis the future. Now, you may think that that's not you, but you may have said in your lifetime or thought things like this, right? That's disrespectful because those kids sit in front of the games and they can concentrate for hours. That's disrespectful. That's disrespectful. That was a parent. Kid almost cried when he told me that his parents said that to him. That really hurts the kids. And the reason it hurts them is because they work really hard for the results they get. I remember one, my nephew coming home and he's saying his parents went out, their computers had broken, they went out to get new ones. While they were out, he fixed them. <laughs> Normal, right? Kids do that. You know what his mother said when he came back? When they came back? She said, you got lucky. That was, he still remembers that. But the reason that's important is because people are people. So if we disrespect,